Thank you for being with us tonight at Honey on the Slate. And we are about to take another lesson from Pastor John Hora. And I believe it's on the book of Ephesians. Yeah, we're in the book of Ephesians. You got it. We're 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 kind of coming to the end of, of, of the book in chapter six. And I mentioned moments ago to Lilia that. I'm going to try to finish up tonight, but I can't guarantee it. Um, the only reason I mention that is because after tonight, we have the rest of the month of August off. So the next scheduled Honey on the Slate will be the 6th of September. So uh, that's when I want, I would like to start into the book of Philippians uh, then. But if I don't, who cares? Um, I, do, I don't want to, I don't want to miss anything, um, here. So we're not in a rush. Thank you. I, I kind of, I kind of sense that vibe from all of you and I appreciate your, uh, your, uh, resting in the spirit and wanting this to be led by the spirit, not by a, a man's schedule. So we were talking about the armor and now we've come up to verse 18 where Paul uh, well, I want to say something about about the about prayer. It's not part of the armor, but it's essential in 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 the battlefield. Um, uh, let me see here. Um, it's it's essential to winning spiritual battles. Is prayer. Um, it's not a part of the armor, um, but think about in a in the battlefield. It's essential that the troops have communication with their commander, and that means this, that's this, back in the day it used to be flags, and the and with the Jews uh, they would carry their banner staff to identify their tribes. Each tribe had their different banner, and um, uh, and also Moses when he'd hold his arms up, they prevailed against Jehoshaphat. You know that uh, uh, in that battle and. Um, if he got tired, his, his, you know, they didn't prevail. So there's, there's something about the commander and the troops they, uh, that uh, is essential. And you all know by now, I've mentioned so many times, I collect telegraph equipment from the Civil War period to around the turn of the century. And that was the first um, uh, war that was negotiated using uh, the telegraph, electronic sophisticated communications. Before that, it was hand signals. It was messengers carrying, you know, things in a in a you know saddlebag and trying to get the word across um, and sending spies in. And it was all manual, you know, trying to get the information across. Information is critical in battle, and even more so, probably the most. It probably all derives from prayer in spiritual warfare. Um, so bearing that in mind. Um, I'm going to read what Paul says, and I want to go into some comments about this. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So we, he's mentioning different types of praying, but he's, he prefaces the whole thing, praying with all prayer and supplication. Um supplication is it means when you go to god based upon your need not necessarily his ability we know he's able and we know he's willing um to you know for for our favor um but the the prayer of supplication is you're making an appeal about a specific need you're the supplicant appealing to to god um so with all prayer and supplication so paul's differentiating between prayer and supplication that first word uh, with all prayer is um uh that means uh to pray primarily to god because you can pray in asking somebody for something uh you can pray to a man but it doesn't mean the prayer like we appeal to god uh based upon his grace um and then with all let's see praying with all prayer the second word prayer is um uh, that is addressed to God um, or it's a place that's set apart for offering prayer and it's by implication uh, a spoken oratory 
um, uh, or to pray earnestly. So um, knowing that he has the, regarding to his power, we know that he has the power um, and he, uh, the one that we're appealing to, that he's got the power to give prominence to, our, uh, uh, and also giving prominence to our personal devotion. So those are two distinct different uh, things. Now, when he talks about in the spirit, that's that's really what I want to hit on tonight, because there's a lot of, or I would say in the church world, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what that means. Um, the the but where the church where I came from, where I grew up in the in the Bible, was a charismatic church, and every time they saw in the spirit, like um, they 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 equated that with speaking in tongues or with miracles or 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 something. Uh, of the charismatic gifts. So praying in the spirit is praying in a supernatural, uh, with a supernatural ability, and they that's speaking in tongues in their reading of this. Um, how do you pray in the spirit? And what does that mean? And so I want to take a look at being in the spirit or doing things in the spirit and seeing if we can get uh, a better understanding of what that means because it's used a lot. Paul uses it a lot. Um, first of all, it does not mean in tongues here. That's not what he's trying, what he's getting at. Um, so there's things that you can do in the spirit. We see that's, that's not necessarily praying. Um, you can just be in the spirit as John was when he received the revelation. He says, I, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Remember? Well, um, and you can rejoice in the Holy Spirit. That's uh, in, in Luke. Um, you can uh, decide something in the Holy Spirit. Paul purposed in the Spirit when he had passed through Macedonia to go to Jerusalem. It's possible to have one's conscience bear witness in the Spirit. Um, that's what Paul was saying in Romans. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost slash spirit um and it's possible to have access to god in the holy spirit uh it's possible to love in the holy spirit colossians 1 8 you learned it our dear from epaphras our dear fellow servant is a faithful minister on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit it's possible to walk in the comfort of the holy spirit uh, we see in uh, Acts 9.31, then uh, had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. Now, these are things that we see that the Spirit can enable, but guess what? Guess what else can do that? All, all but one, the flesh can do the same thing. Um when it's, uh, let's see, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit or not. Can you be in the flesh? Yes. So John was distinguishing that normally we're in the flesh. I'm in the spirit. I knew because it was something was happening. So he contrasts that with the default setting. Um, can you rejoice? Can you rejoice? Well, we rejoice in the Holy Spirit. We, we, we read that. But can you rejoice in the flesh if Cubs win or Sox win and you go to the bar? You're rejoicing in the flesh. These are things you can do in the flesh or in the spirit. What I want to talk about is what is what is the difference. Um, and you can you can decide something in the Holy Spirit, like Paul said. He purposed in the spirit. Well, I know people who purpose in the flesh to whatever this or that. You know, it's like we're the the I forget which uh, book it's in, but it's. We're, we're admonished to, if we say, let us go into this or that city and we'll stay a while and we'll buy and we'll sell and we'll great, we'll get much gain. Instead of saying that, you should say, Lord willing, we'll do this, that, and the other thing. So just doing it on your own, the flesh, saying, Lord willing, the spirit, follow me. Um, and it's possible to have one's conscience bear witness in the spirit, Romans 9, 1. Uh, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Well, folks, I got news for you. Your conscience can bear witness in the flesh. Your conscience can be seared. Um, in Titus 1.15, it can be defiled. 
Um, we know sinners who uh, sleep soundly at night after debau living a debaucherous life all weekend long. Um, so just the conscience can be seared, can be corrupted. So it's not let your conscience be your guide, like Jiminy Cricket said. It's not a it's not a bad place to start, but there's more. Um, and then is uh, we can walk in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Well, I know people who walk in the comfort of the flesh. They don't have anything to do with spiritual matters, and they take vacations and they do uh, mountain climbing and all this other stuff. Whatever they do in the flesh. Okay, so how do you then? Can we see that there's two ways to do? This? How do you do it in the spirit? How does one do that? Uh, I've heard people say, well, it's to have a conscious uh, acknowledgement of the presence of the Lord as you're praying. Okay. Well, explain that to me. Um, it, it's another way of, of understanding it. If we look at um, uh, a verse, Romans 8, 6, Paul says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Carnally, being carnally minded is death. What well, is being carnally minded? Well, carnality means your flesh, your physical body. Your body has lusts. It has passions. It has needs. We, we care for our body. But our body, if we get our signals, our marching orders just from our flesh, we're going to only eat potato chips and, and, and ice cream. So there's some point in there where we discipline it and we don't let it just be completely unbridled. It's just wisdom of the world. It's wisdom of just good. It's good and reasonable to do those, those kinds of things. Well, that's not necessarily being spiritually minded, but it's a step in the right direction of recognizing that your flesh unbridled, there's no good thing dwells in the flesh. So thinking about carnally minded versus spiritually minded is, is a beginning, it's entry level spiritual discernment. Um, and along those 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 lines, the being the minded part of it, being minded um, in Galatians 5.16, uh, we're admonished to be none otherwise minded. Don't think this way. So you have volition, control over your thoughts in which way you're being minded, whether it's spiritually or carnally or uh, um, any other way of, of, of dividing it. Philippians 3.15 says, be thus minded regarding pressing toward the mark of the high price of the calling in Christ. Um, and in Titus 2.6, be sober minded. So these are things we have control over the things that we're minding and where they're coming from and where they're leading us to. So that's in it's a cousin to the idea of of Colossians 3 2 minding uh, of things above setting your affections on things above not on things on the earth. You know if you will if you find your life uh, here in this world you will lose your life Jesus said. And he who loses his life for my sake will, will find life in him, eternal life. So set your affections on the things above. Um, where Christ sits at the right hand of, of, of God. Um, and he says, not on things on the earth. Then the next verse is, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. We should be acting like that more. This life is not what this physical life, the short years that we have on this planet, they matter for God. They don't matter that much for us. It's, this is not where to get your kicks on Route 66. Uh, sorry. Um, or where we grab all the gusto that we can get. Um, 2 Peter 3, 2 uh, Paul told us to be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the prophets uh, and of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. And Philippians 2, 6, Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Okay, so all of these, these things, these are separate little instructional things, all of which together 
point to a life in the spirit, how we're to live in the spirit and not in the flesh. The flesh gets its orders from the world. The flesh gets its orders from the God of this world. It gets its orders from its passions and its appetites um, and its slothfulness um, and its pride um, in its desire to please men and to fit into whatever group, think, tribe, clan, party, be like everybody else, uh, you know, validation by men, those kind of things. We need to temper those, those urges and seek those things which are above, the light things, the things of the gossamer realm, the things where it leads to life and peace, not to death. Um, now, um, read from Galatians 4, starting at verse 8. Um, How be it then, when you didn't know God, when you knew not God, you did service unto, or you served and worshipped, them which by nature are not gods. Um, them is better translated beings, unto beings which by nature are not gods. We served these these other spirits. When you knew not God, you were serving the dark side. Verse nine, but now after that you have known God or rather are known by God. Those things go together. When you receive the Holy Spirit, when you've humbled yourself and you've had a vision of Christ, a revelation of, of Christ, a revelation of you as a sinner and him as a savior, uh, his offer of the grace based upon his works and only by your believing it, no works on your part. You are known by him. You know him now and you know that he knows you now. The woman at the well, he told me all the things that I ever did. Um, in my salvation experience, I realized that all the times that I was being a selfish jerk, Jesus was there because he started telling me the things that I had done. And I, I thought, how is it that you know this? And then I realized he didn't even have to say a word. I was, oh no, you were there the whole time I was screwing around. And he still loved me. He never left. So we are known by God. God who is omnipresent knows your thoughts afar off, the Bible says. How much more, since we've received him by his spirit, being filled with his spirit, we're not alone. There's somebody with you all the time who is aware of your thoughts. And this is where Paul says, pray without ceasing. Our dialogue should, and our inner dialogue should constantly be reviewing uh, things with God, things about our prayer life, things about our love life, who, the, the people that we care for, our family, um, our our choices in life, the the needs of others, and how we deal with things that are too overwhelming for us to be able to cope with on our own. Things, you know, the world, all the crap that goes on here, um, uh, it, it it weighs heavily on on your heart we, the, we're in our constant dialogue with god it's kind of like washing those those heartaches and keeping it pure and clean and and pulling and calling upon his power to to help us and to know that there's effectiveness in our uh in our prayers and in our tears um so uh that now after that you have known god or rather are known by god how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, or better way of understanding it, is the pitiful ruling spirits. Well, these are these fallen angels, these other gods, little g's, and Paul's lamenting, he's criticizing or trying to correct the Galatians um, who have turned uh, back to the old uh, habits. Um, 1 Corinthians 2.11 for what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of a man or except the spirit of a man that's in him? You know, the spirit of the man, the spirit of the, the spirit of you inside you. Um, what knows the things of a man? The spirit. 
The spirit, your spirit, you know what's going on inside you. I remember when I was, um, uh, when I get this idea, I was, I was thinking about why people go to the doctor and it, uh, and, or was it the doctor, the priest, uh, or the, uh, the attorney, or the doctor, the priest, the accountant, and the attorney. Uh, these are, we, we go to experts because we don't think we're capable of figuring it out ourselves. And so we run to the doctors, especially people who are, you know, hypochondriacs. They get one little thing, oh, it's cancer, and they run to the doctors. Um, well, the doctor asks you how you're feeling. He doesn't have x-ray eyes. He asks you how you're feeling because you know you have nerves that tell you my stomach hurts or my elbow hurts or I've got back pain or I don't know, whatever. So that's the same thing. It's similar in a physical sense to what uh, man knows the things of a man except the spirit which is in him. So if you think about that, you know what you're thinking all the time, right? So then he goes, even so, the things of God knows no man but the spirit of God. How do we know anything of God, the truth of God? It's through his spirit. So you, we are infused with his spirit. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have him to stay in you. He st sticks closer than a brother. Um, so we're, we're th our thoughts are open to him with whom we have to, to do. And again, I'm trying to get us to think in terms of we are we should be acquainted. We should be able to discern the spirit. It's such a subtle thing because it's not physical. Our senses are made to um, uh, to sense physical things, dense matter, uh, things of this world. Um, we have uh, the the conscience. Uh, is is a thing that that has to do with our with moral conduct um, and whatnot, but the things of the spirit of God, it's a it, it's all has to do with His spirit coming into us and making us spiritually aware. You're you're changed from the inside out by God's spirit. It's not just we didn't just adopt a new way of thinking. It's not a lifestyle change. It's not. Um, uh, you know, a 12-step program. It's not a matter of perfecting your flesh or having a better life here. Yes, there's benefits to serving God in the spirit because it's the spirit that quickens us. It gives us light, but it gives us uh, a life. It gives us light and, and revelation uh, of things. Um, because Romans 8, 27 says, and he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit. So God is with you and in you and searches the hearts of men. And when Paul says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, can we see that it's not just an exercise of the head and it's not just an exercise of the heart without the head? You know, that praying in tongues can come out of your heart in an unknown language. Praying in the head can just come out of your head without consulting your heart or engaging your heart. And uh, it can come out, wrote, and prescribe prayers and repeti re re repetitions of the same thing, saying the same things over and over again. Um, with How do you have faith if it's just out of your head? How do you have confidence that God has heard and that you are relieved of the burden of the whatever you are praying for, because you we know that he hears our prayers. This is a faith relationship. So faith and the spirit just are, they just are so much working together. Where does one end and the other begin? I mean, these are things like the, the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword divided between the soul and the spirit, the, you know, uh, kind of a thing. So that's um, only God can really know these things, but he can show them to us because if, if we know the word of God, and our mind is renewed according to that. We begin using the word of God can discern between the soul and the spirit or the flesh and the spirit. The soul is the mind, the will, the emotions. Uh, but we need to be able to discern between the, the flesh with its passions and with its slothfulness and with its doubt and unbelief 
and it's allegiance to the world because it's we're still tied to the as long as we have a flesh body it's still going to have the the uh we're still affected by gravity um so as an example so um i hope that helps discern some of these these things i'm going to be talking more about this on a sunday soon uh, but then he asks us to pray for all saints or pray concerning all believers. And he says, and pray for me that utterance may be given unto me um, so that I, uh, let's see, with boldness um, may uh, be able to speak, speak freely um, about the mystery of the gospel. He says, I'm an ambassador. I'm an ambassador in chains. Uh, but pray that therefore I may speak freely with boldness um, the way that I uh, ought to ought to speak. But also that you may know my affairs and how I do. Um, Tychicus, a well-beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, about all things that Paul's up to, because uh, he's in jail. Um and whom I've sent to you, have sent to, to you for the same purpose that you might know our affairs and that you might, that he might comfort your hearts. And I, I looked at those two verses and I saw a family there. I saw Paul loved the people he's writing to. Um, and so much so that he knew they had a concern for him and that he would send Tychicus who would um, uh, be able to comfort them uh, uh, and then also how he closes, um, the grace be with you, um, with them that love our Lord Jesus Christ um, in uncorruptness, sincerely in uncorruptness. So that concludes the book of Ephesians. And if I may take my liberty, I wanted to read from the Bollinger uh, Bible. Um, he has a, a note about verse 315, about the whole family in heaven and on earth is named. Um, if you remember that verse. And he says that the word family is an unfortunate rendering of the Greek word patria. We get patriot from that. We get potter as in father from that, or we get uh, patriarch uh, from uh, patria. Our English word takes its derivation from the lowest in the household, familius. That's the servants or the slaves, the staff in the house, familius. The Latin familia was sometimes used of the household of servants and sometimes of all the members of a family under the power of the potter familius. Potter, father the, of the family. But the idea of patria is Hebrew. It's a group or class of families, all claiming descent from one potter, one father. Think the 12 tribes of Israel. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 sons. So they each had their unique identity as one of the 12 tribes, but they were of the same father. Um, Joseph was of the house and lineage, the, the family of David. Um, and the, the word denotes a clan all descended from a common stock. Now, uh, Bollinger goes on to explain that how do we how we apply this? And he says, God has many families in heaven and earth, both in this age and into that, that age which is to come. Says, but with selfish uh, disregard of this fact, we see only one family, and that, of course, must be the church, for that is the family to which we belong, right? Understand that. But Bollinger taking a pointing at 
God has many families in heaven and on earth. I found that very, very intriguing. Um, thus, we claim everything for ourselves, especially if it involves blessing and mercy or glory is attached to it. And we completely ignore the fact that many of these families, plural, families of God are named in scripture. Well, first of all, the notion that God has other sons in heaven, the divine council, the sons of God that existed, that watched, the, if we read Job, they, the sons of God watched the creation. So they pre-existed us. And these, of course, are the, they were the angels that, that fell and were distributed to the nations. But sons are family, right? Now, um, so in this in scripture, um, in, in the book of Ephesians in one twenty one, we have principality, power, might, and dominion. Um, without taking the time right now to drill those down, those refer to groups of families, have different agencies, different specialties, different functions, but they're in a negative sense because these are the ones that fell. but nonetheless, families of God. Um, the first two being again mentioned in uh, chapter three, verse 10, the principalities and powers where, where, where Paul says the principalities and powers in the heavenlies to whom God is even now manifesting his manifold wisdom by means of the church through us. He's showing something to those angels, to those sons, the fallen ones. He's showing his salvation as using the church, his body as an object lesson. They're watching. Others are mentioned in Colossians 1.16, 1 Peter 3.22. What these heavenly families may be, we do not know. The Greek words reveal to us no more than the English do because they pertain to the unseen world of which we know nothing. We're kind of feeling around through the scriptures. We know it's there. We, we don't have any sensory ability to perceive it. So we take that all by faith. Um, but to limit this verse to the church, as many do, and to interpret it in, a in unholy, unscriptural terms, of the church militant and the church triumphant, et cetera. Um, it's, it, it loses the revelation of the great truth of God and, and puts error in it if we just limit the church is his family. Rightly divided, the families of God named in the New Testament are in heaven, principalities, powers, mights, dominions, thrones, angels, and archangels. Among the families on earth, are number one, Israel. Number two, the Israel of God. Those are the, the Jews by blood who are saved, who are born again believers in Christ. Um, and then the church of God, of course, of which we're, we're a part. So the there's different takes on what exactly is the Israel of God, where Paul uses that phrase in Galatians um, 616. Um, I'm not an expert on that, but Bollinger de delineates uh, that of the families on earth, we have Israel because he dealt, he's not done with them. The program is he still has more for Israel and the Israel of God is the Jewish believers unique from the Gentile believers and then the church of God, which would be both the Jew and the Greek that are saved. So I found that interesting. Um, I hope uh, that you know, helps to clear some things up in your mind or give you some more things to think about. And so I apologize for running over um, four minutes. So uh, if anybody has anything you'd like to add or any questions, I'd love to hear from you. So your thoughts. Hey, we had some people come in a few minutes ago and uh, thank you for joining us either way. We don't mind at all. But if you want to catch the beginning of this you can see it on YouTube. I will post it tonight. But if anybody has any 
questions or comments, please feel free to post them in the chat and I will read them to Pastor John or or you can open your camera and microphone and, and talk and let us know what you think. Yeah, love to hear from you. I've got some time. You know, uh, going back to prayer, we were taught how to pray when we were little, right? And there's not a lot of teachings on it for adults. Uh, that's my view. Maybe I'm wrong. So it's good to go back and visit that subject. Well, I hope they gave you some things to think about. I think we have we, we get prayer so wrong. Uh, remember when I did the teaching about uh, New Covenant prayer? Um, it's from a resurrection life standpoint. It's from a the finished work standpoint. It's from having favor with God that we can boldly approach him. And it's also from him, we have intimate fellowship with him constantly. Um, uh, and then you can state prayers. You don't have to end a prayer within Jesus' name. Don't you think he knows that? We tend you think to he knows we're saved? Mystify it. And we tend to believe that there is a certain pattern or formula that will actually get through heaven and to his ears. But just saying the word Jesus is. You know why that is? We don't have a proper understanding of who we are in Christ. We think we're less than. And so we strive to try to adhere to something that we think is the right way to do it, that we automatically think, oh, I'm, I'm doing it wrong. And there's also the fact that there's a lot of people who don't have a good relationship with their own father. So they don't know how to relate to a father. And they're learning about what a father really is now after being saved. So it takes some time and it's all a matter of just like you said, knowing who you are in Christ and knowing that there is nothing wrong you can say. And the right. Holy Spirit right. Is don't complicate it. Don't get all religious about it. The Holy Spirit is there to filter it all. And God already knows everything you're thinking. Yeah, he knows your thoughts. Just just be open with him. Mm -hmm. Speak to him plainly. Don't don't cloak it in religious talk. Oh, thy holy father, if I bequeath thee, the, your supplicant approaches your throne with... <laughs> Eh. no be real folks i always feel Don't like step I, on anybody's toes to pray in spanish i kind of feel like he understands me better when i'm speaking in spanish <laughs> but we all, have, you. we all have our own unique special relationship with god and you know what works for you and like you said you just need to step away from the fear and the mysticism and know that God is listening to you right now. He loves you. He already knows everything you did and he still loves you and he still loves me. Yes. Amen. So thank you amen. so much. It seems like we don't have any questions as of now, maybe on Sunday they will arise, but I just want to thank you for, for this teaching and looking forward to. Well, I love that. I love, I love being with you all because I love you all. And um, we'll take a couple of Wednesdays off. I think you're traveling a little bit one of those days and I decided to take one of those days, take a personal day. So we'll, we will be back here Wednesday, the 6th of September, God willing. And we'll continue rejoicing in the Lord and learning more about the glory of God through his word. So you guys all have sweet dreams tonight. You're dismissed. I love you. Those of you who attend, I'll see you on Sunday at church.